Okay, um, it's a little bit tricky. So I, I, when I was preparing the lecture, um, it was tricky to pitch uh, something that kind of appeals to all of you. And then the federated learning is, um, it turns out it's quite complicated, uh, complicated thing. You, you do need to know quite a lot of uh, concepts to kind of get understanding of what is actually happening. So um, let me try and then we will see we will see how it goes. So the first thing is that we have the uh, questions. You can ask questions in the Mentimeter uh, at any time. And I will see them here. You can ask the questions in uh, Zoom chat for the online people too. I should see them. Uh, and the question for you, what is machine learning? If you were to explain to my daughter, who is um, 11 years old, what is machine learning? What, what would you say? Okay, yeah. So making a machine do something a, a human can do. Yeah. So recommendation systems is an example of uh, machine learning. Yeah, Ben. Spot patterns. So we have uh, a more general answer, which is uh, to teach to teach machine. Okay, let's say M to do something. Human can do. Okay, so we will come back to that in a moment. Uh, recommendations. Uh, patterns, spot patterns. Okay, so um, there is a, a, a branch of AI. Uh, which was uh, called um, expert systems. Expert systems. And the expert systems were kind of uh, hot, you know, 20 years ago or so. And what we were doing, we were asking experts how they do certain things and we were encoding it. And then the machine could do the same thing. So we were asking uh, like a doctor how they make a diagnosis. And the doctor was saying, well, I asked this question and this, and depending what the answers are, we have some sort of decision tree. So you can have like a, a decision tree and with like yes and no answers uh, and blah, 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 right? And then at the end of the interview, you say, okay, that's the, that's the diagnosis or that's the thing. Or you can say, okay, how the banks give a loan. They say, okay, we check if the person has a job, how much they earn versus how much they want to borrow, what is, we calculate the risk factor, and then we decide if the person can get the loan or not, right? So we were kind of encoding uh, some sort of behavior. So kind of it's an encoding um, of the behavior uh, into the machine to do something normally a human was doing, right? Would that be machine learning? Well, Yeah, so we, we have kind of a broader category. I, I didn't want to talk about AI in general, but so we have kind of an umbrella term, which is like an AI, and that is definitely fits under that umbrella. Uh, and then we have kind of a term, which is a machine learning, and that usually doesn't fit into that term, right? So um, because with the machine learning, the focus is on, on the learning, right? Uh, and the, the focus here is on the teaching, right? Uh, so if the teaching is kind of a continuous and it's beyond what we do initially, then it would be machine learning. But if the, all the teaching is like upfront, we design it and then it just works. Yeah, exactly. Then, then it's sort of borderline. So this is, uh, this is not wrong, but th there is a bit of nuance of how, how it works, right? Uh, ben? Yeah, machine learning is more here's a bunch of data. Give all of the AI a lot of input, and then to kind of make assumptions 
So here we have a training a mathematical model to predict by optimizing the loss function. The machine gets input and gets output, and they need to find the connection between the input and output. That, that's nice. Uh, the machine learning from others' experiences. A lot of if statements. So a lot of if statements is more this, right? So a lot of if statements uh, is more kind of AI uh, or gold old, old fashioned AI. Machine learning is a little bit less. Um, of course, there are if statements. I'm not. I, I, I don't uh, say there are, aren't. But there is kind of an interplay between the terms a little bit, right? So we have those two. We have kind of recommendations and predictions. We have the patterns. Uh, and we have this kind of a feedback uh, where we have some sort of model uh, and the model kind of uh, checks something from outside world and then modifies itself as time goes on such that the model kind of improves. So here, as uh, someone said, you know, we're trying to optimize the loss function. So we're trying to make the fit between the inputs and the outputs kind of as good as possible based on some training set. Yeah. 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 Perfect. Yeah. So we kind of on the same page, on the same page with this. So what um, what I was trying to find is uh, like what people, how people define machine learning, and I, I found like uh, a funny um, definition from Google that machine learning is just matrix multiplication. <laughs> At the end of the day, all you're doing is you're doing some form of matrix multiplications somehow, somewhere. All right. And that's not far from the truth. You may have some if statements, yes. You may have some different encodings that just matrices, yes. Uh, you can use decision trees, yes. But by far, the majority of stuff that you do is just you encode your problem into some form of numerical uh, representation. And you're doing some form of matrix multiplication to come up with an answer. And then you change the weights, you change the, you know, you modify your change, uh, your, your weights and your bias to make the predictions as accurate as possible, right? So I don't think that's very far from the truth, right? Um, especially if you treat machine learning in a kind of a narrow way with a, a neural networks focus, right? Neural networks is just this, um, yeah. But machine learning is a little bit bigger. All right, so um, so that's my next question. So, what kinds of machine learning do you know, and when they are useful? Yeah. So maybe I will keep this because that is. Uh, Arsha, you already uh, answering this. So what types of machine learning do you know? Yeah, so we have supervised and unsupervised. What else? Say it again. Reinforcement, yeah, reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning. Yeah, what else? Neural networks we mentioned, right? So we have neural networks, we have deep neural networks. What else do we know? Uh, supervised, unsupervised object detection, th those are applications. So computer vision and um, object detection is an application of a particular method. Usually deep neural networks are used for that, uh, but it's not a kind of ML, right? Ah, oh, yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, so th those are used for, yeah, uh, that's, that's a really good answer. So computer vision and specific like tasks are object detection. Uh, a use for which ones? Which ones you could do? So computer vision, which of those we can apply to computer vision tasks? Most of them, yeah. Uh, object detection? Yeah. 
reinforcement learning. It's like, no, you're wrong. Yeah, so for object detection, we have already some reservations, right? So uh, reinforcement learning for object detection doesn't sound that easy to do. Uh, unsupervised learning, maybe, if you don't know the objects you want to track up front, but that's a little bit questionable. And then these two are kind of good and supervised, right? I mean, the, the neural networks usually are an example of supervised learning. Do you know some neural network uh, learning methods that are not supervised? Yeah. Sorry? Clustering, yes. Yeah. So there are some there are some unsupervised neural networks uh, projects as well uh, that are used for clustering and for uh, detecting certain classes, like evolving certain classes from the data, right? Um, Okay, so that that's kind of uh, is is nice. Uh, you have um, you have kind of different things to choose from, and then you can kind of apply them for uh, recommendation or prediction systems, spotting patterns, or substituting human with with a machine. Right. So let's let's go from the bottom. For this one, what would be the most natural thing to do? Yeah, as uh, uh, um, no, like if we need to spot patterns, what sort of machine learning uh, class we would very likely to apply? What would we use? Yeah. Unsupervised, yeah. So for spotting patterns, we would most likely use unsupervised, some form of clustering maybe, right? Uh, for recommendations and predictions? <laughs> ben? Yeah, supervised. supervised. For teaching machine to do something in general? Yeah. Deep. Supervised. It would go deep. You could depends yes, yes. depends on what the task is. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so um, let's let's carry on. So um, a typical workflow uh, for machine learning, and you did some machine learning projects last time and the uh, introduction to the, to the course. Um, you basically have to get the data, right? So you're getting the data and then sometimes you have missing rows, sometimes something needs a bit of cleaning, sometimes the numbers are represented as strings, not as numbers. Sometimes you have a floating point precision that doesn't make sense and you want to like, you know, round some of the columns. Uh, so you're doing some sort of a cleaning, pre-processing and generally preparing the data for, for processing, right? Then if the training is um, supervised or unsupervised, we usually want to evaluate how our training went, right? So we want to test how the final outcome works. And to do that, usually you need to split your data into a training and test set, right? So you're training it on the training set and then you're testing it on the test set, right? You can do that multiple times. So you can split it multiple times and then train it and then take averages. Why? Why we would do that? Yeah? To avoid overfitting and to avoid bias. So when you pick data uh, for the, let's say we have, um, uh, let's say we have um, some uh, data set which has uh, two columns. So, so um, uh, three columns. So you have the first two columns and then there is some sort of outcome, right? So we want to, to, test, uh, to test something. Um, and then we have, um, right? So if um, it's just like a, a, a very uh, artificial example, but that example shows that for majority of the cases, the outcome is zero, right? So if this row is not included into training set, our model will learn that no matter what you go in as an input, right? So in and out, 
if this is not included, then the, the model will learn, okay, just put zero, right? And we have 25% error rate, right? Uh, if that row is included into training, then it will kind of work quite well, right? Uh, so depending like how it happens that the partition happens, you, may be, you might have a bias in your training because you haven't like uh, considered um, independence and kind of a dependency of the, of the, of the training and um, testing sets. Okay, so then once we do this, then we design what we want to do. Is it a supervised learning? Is it not? Like what are the parameters? How many neural network layers we want? What is the starting point? Are we starting from random place or are we using some pre-existing model? And so on and so forth. And then we do the training, right? So we design and we train the model. And then we go iterations. So we evaluate what we got. Uh, whether we liked it or not, and then we go back. Uh, sometimes we don't change this, uh, so we just go back here. We change slightly what we're doing, and we re retrain. Uh, or we say, uh, actually, we have to completely change what we're doing, so we go back all the way there. So this is um, a typical workflow that you use in a normal machine learning settings. And now, um, let's see. So what does this workflow, how this workflow will differ if you try to apply it to the federated machine learning? This is a question a little bit upfront because uh, we haven't talked about federated machine learning yet, but what is your understanding of federated machine learning and how this workflow will change? So where do we need extra steps? Yes, so we cannot really do this, right? <laughs> uh, up front, uh, because we have, uh, so now we have um, nodes. Let's say we have three nodes, they have some data, right? And now they have, uh, we have to decide how we're doing the splitting. Like, will we use one of them as a test data set and these two for training, or are we dividing each of them uh, into training and uh, testing? So we have a little bit of a choice. So uh, between point uh, one and two, we, we need to design how we do that. Um, of course, how we do that in a central place is also kind of tricky. Like you take 20% or 25, there are some designs to, to do, right? But this is a little bit different because you kind of uh, dealing with uh, data being spread, spread around. Um, how about the first, about cleaning and pre-processing? Well, each of these guys need to do that, right? Individually, right? So each of them has to do point one themselves, right? And we have to coordinate, so there is, the point one stays, but we need a little bit of uh, coordination such that uh, they do this point one the same way, right? If we are rescaling something or if we're cleaning the, like if we have an empty, uh, we, we have a CSV file and we have some text, comma, some number, comma, some text, and then there is a missing text, we have a missing number. Is the missing number zero? Or is the missing number minus one what we do? Like we have to agree that everybody does the same thing, right? Um, so there is a bit of a coordination before point one. And then there is a little bit of a design before point two. And then we design and train the model. So uh, that's the most tricky part, right? The most tricky part is that uh, point three, um, is so, so point two also is done on each of the devices separately, but we have this, uh, you know, point, point five. So we have some kind of a coordinator. We have some coordination to do and point zero is done by the coordinator and point one, point five is done by the coordinator. One and two are done here. Number three, okay. So three will be done here, right? Uh, individually on the data sets that they have, 
uh, but we kind of, if we do that, then we don't have the benefit of everybody learning what has, what they've learned, right? So the, like the, the loss function here will kind of uh, go down. So if we, if we measuring whatever, you know, potentially the loss function should go down and here and here as well, but this model, so we have model two and model one, but they have nothing in common right yet, right? So point three, we do individually, but then we need to have 3.5, which is we somehow have to share what they've learned, right? So we have to share um, what they've learned individually in each of the data sets, such that kind of the overall the system benefits. So what we do is, again, we have um, a little bit of logic that needs to extract the delta of what the initial model was. So model like uh, this is M1 uh, prime, and then the delta between uh, model the original one and the, the final after the training. And this delta needs to be kind of shared in such a way that the other systems can kind of update their models as well, right? So we have some sort of abstract representation of the, of the model. Each of them has their own one, but once we learn, we, we learn something kind of locally, we need to tell the others what we've learned such that it um, benefits them to update the model as well, right? And we can, uh, we can either do it by passing the, the deltas from one node to another in some orchestrated way, or we can pass the deltas into the uh, coordinator and then the coordinator passes some aggregated deltas back. But you do need to kind of merge what you have and what the delta is, right? Uh, and you want to pre uh, preserve some properties. So you have generally um, two properties that you want to hold. One is that Nobody like uh, node one, node two, and node three will learn about what the other nodes data is, right? So the nodes uh, cannot, cannot learn the data. They can learn from the data of the other models, but not the data, right? And then this, the, the second requirement, so that's one, the second one is the same, but for the coordinator, right? So the coordinator should not know what each of the data is on each of the of the nodes, right? And then we have to do evaluation. So we have to tell, um, so initially when they train, there is an evaluation local, there is a local evaluation and this one will have a certain error, this one will have a certain error, this one will have a certain error. Then we do this aggregation, we distribute the, the, the difference to all of them. They will update the models, and now they will recalculate what is the error after um, update of the model here, here, and here, right? Will the error rate always go down for everybody after an update? Might not go, right? But uh, we designed the system in such a way that the evaluation for the sum of everybody or some aggregate of everybody will go down, right? If the sum of, of some sort aggregate for everybody doesn't go down, our learning is not gonna work, right? But for in, individual ones, the error may not go down because you may have some artifacts in the data that are in contradiction with the other data sets, right? Okay, so this is uh, a, a very um, quick summary Kind of high level summary of what is happening and how you need to convert uh, your typical workflow for a centralized data set uh, when you're working with the uh, decentralized and federated data. So that leads us to the federated ML. So what it is? Well, it is uh, a, a method to allow decentralized nodes to participate in a learning activity without the centralized controller knowing about all the data, right? Um, <coughs> it can be from privacy reasons. Most of the time it is because of the privacy reasons, but it can, sorry, but it can also be for other reasons, okay? 
So what might be the other reason why we need to use federated learning instead of centralized learning? Yeah. Yeah, so privacy, sensitive data, what else? Yeah, so if you, for example, working in a IoT settings, the data is not sensitive. You just have temperature sensors all over the town, right? And if you had a centralized model, all the data from, you know, the entire Jovigo, entire Norway will have to go to the central server and then be processed there. It is kind of inefficient and ineffective. Uh, so it might be better if the counties or, uh, you know, if Inland or Jovik kind of do it locally here, uh, because we can have an efficient way of exchanging data between sensors in a kind of a local area network. And then we only need to exchange some sort of model parameters with the rest of the country to learn something, right? Um, so the, the actual nature of the data might be a reason. And the data is not sensitive. Uh, but it often is, right? And the privacy properties usually have to hold, right? All right, so, okay. So now I kind of have spoiled the, the, the question a little bit. So what does it mean to have data on the edge? IoT, IoT devices, yeah. What else? Data on your phone, IoT devices, very good. What else? Be creative. Yeah. So all the data that is produced by some form of edge device uh, could be a mobile phone, could be a sensor, could be an IoT device. Uh, mobile phones are the perfect example. And if you browse federated learning and especially Google is doing a lot of it because they have a large platform to deal with, same with Apple. Uh, they want to improve some of the services and they need to do that with a uh, Kind of a large number of phones, but you know how to do it efficiently and effectively. Okay, so that's th those are all good answers. Uh, what do you think about cars, planes, boats? They all generate data, which is kind of local, right? Um, we usually use centralized services where the data is broadcasted and kind of stored centrally. But for some of it, it doesn't have to be centrally stored, right? Um, some of the data can be used kind of locally. Uh, and for example, if I, if I have Yovik and I'm trying to optimize, uh, in Yovik actually, it's not that great because we don't have much traffic and we don't have ma many traffic lights. But imagine that we have some data about traffic and traffic lights and we kind of learning what are the strategies to prevent kind of congestion in, in towns, right? Um, that would be kind of an edge da data, right? Uh, and like having a model here may or may not work in Oslo, for example, but we may want to use some of the data from other cities and find similarities, find patterns and, and so on, right? And uh, again, we don't want to store all the data from the entire world in a single place, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. So we want to kind of keep the data locally, but we want to learn from each other experiences, right? All right, so we have here some examples. Uh, so we have sensors, IoT devices, that's what you said, mobile phones, other mobile devices. So mobile phones is not the only mobile device. It could be drones, could be some delivery uh, vehicles, could be some um yeah portable sensors and so on and so forth cars boats um we have uh for example um smart tvs or tv boxes which have certain data about your preferences of how you use the tv uh they are kind of edge device uh and maybe a recommender system wants to learn from your data what to recommend right um that would be kind of a, a use case as well 
Okay, so um, then um, <coughs> what are the, um, the, the pattern is that we're not passing the data back to the central server, right? We're not passing the data to the central server to do all the learning. Uh, we do cal calculations, we do some processing on the nodes, uh, and then we have kind of some ability to do aggregates. And that's where the, the devil is, right? That's what makes kind of uh, federated learning tricky, but also interesting. And that's where a lot of research is, right? What do those aggregates can be and how much data do they leak, right? So imagine, um, imagine we have, um, um, we have, um, we have a system where, yeah? I feel like this should be kind of aligned because you know, there has a more perfect uh, change of data or such a thing like that, right? And for the data, I mean, that we don't need to use other use. Like, what, what is, what are the results yet? Because the data is just anything where you can use it. At the start time. Um, yeah, so formulate the question. Like, so what, have one good note. yeah, and one of them is something that is linked to this and that has this. Yeah, because where I'm because you don't have the data set, like that note broken, right? Yeah, and where why is that broken? Because that is very specific to that particular node. That's right. Trying to learn the middle nodes so that one node just be called an outlier because it's garden, or because it's not going to have overhead. <coughs> Yeah, so that is a very interesting topic. So we will come back to it a little bit later. So a transparency uh, and, uh, let me see, and kind of um, evaluation of the final result uh, is questionable if you have no control over the quality of the data that is used by the nodes, right? So that is a valid point. Your first part of the question is, if you have um, if you have a large number of nodes, okay, or, or some number of nodes, and then one of them is doing something completely weird, completely uh, unusual compared to everybody else's, the impact on the model, um, the impact on the generated model will be kind of zero. Right? Yeah, that, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. You have the standards and then you can ignore everything else. Exactly. Okay. Because you want the model to train and to generalize based on some magnification factor, yeah. which happen not just in one um, uh, one node, right? Uh, so uh, I po posted in the I posted in the wiki page a, a talk from Google about a uh, Gboard keyboard, keyboard uh, which is learning to predict the the text from inputs, right? And how it works is you have a lot of phones people type stuff and then the, the system analyzes what they typed and then it kind of creates a local model of what the frequencies of different words are and, and so on, right? So each phone will have kind of a database of some frequency of what are the patterns and, and so on and so forth. And then you have some sort of a word list, you know, hi, uh, hello, and, and, and so on. And those are kind of a typical words in English alphabet. But for example, I type cześć, which is like the uh, high in Polish, right? So I'm using kind of a different vocabulary and it will learn like I'm using that word, right? But it's kind of a, it's a different, it's not English word, right? Okay. And you may have like, you know, um, Adam, you may have names. So you have different language, kind of uh, names. And it will also have things like uh, my credit card number, right? Credit card number, right? So because I did typed it in my keyboard and it will, it saw it, right? But because nobody else typed the same number, right? When you start typing my credit card number, it will not predict what it is because it will ignore it because it's not reinforced by all the others, right? Otherwise you would end up with some sensitive data here, which affect, which is only for you. And that would kind of be actually harmful, right? So what we want is we want to discard some very specific aspects or if I type my password, it's even, it's even worse, right? So I have a particular password that I have to type. Uh, and then 
if the model could predict from the first couple of characters what are the possible passwords, <laughs> that would be kind of really bad, right? And that would be overfitting, right? It would be kind of overfitting of the model. So what we want is we want to reduce the impact a single data set has on the model in such a way that if I only use that password and nobody else use that password, it will not go into the model. So what happens if people use sheet passwords and they that same password was used on multiple nodes? Well, that the model will learn it, <laughs> right? And then you can kind of use it to predict what the sheet passwords are uh, because it will tell you like what is the continuation, right? Um, so there are some problems here, right? And, and ben, Ben's point about uh, the impact a single node has and some, um, and some of this is kind of tricky because we, we say only expose data to aggregates, but aggregates can leak personal data, right? If I aggregated all those keyboard uh, patterns into the aggregated model, it will predict my password, right? If, it, if the training was really good and it, it learned my, my password uh, to, to predict like what is the ending of the password if I start with a couple of first characters, right? If, I, if, if it overfit the data, it would kind of work. It would leak the data, right? So aggregates, uh, aggregated data is not, um, aggregated data is not necessarily like a solution that always work. Most of the time it works, but sometimes it actually leaks what you don't want to leak, right? So I encourage you to check this talk. It's kind of a very interesting, uh, but in some cases it, it works quite well. Aggregation is kind of fine. So I, I wanted to kind of, um, yeah, let's do the example and then we'll have a break. So let's use an example where we are in the building and we have classes. And then within the class, we gather data about, I don't know, your income, okay? So we learned like what is the income in the, in the room and we calculate an average, right? So each room has, uh, it has some data. Uh, and then what we do is we kind of ask each other uh, or, or we have some sort of protocol. We kind of uh, announce the income. We, uh, so we have some numbers. Uh, and then we divide them by the count of how many are, uh, you know, how many us here. So in, a, in that case, it would be five. And then we'll have some number. We do this, and then we have this kind of uh, aggregated number, right? And then this aggregated number, we pass to the next team. They, so we have N1, they have N2, and they have N3. And then this, this guy adds this one to this one. So they have kind of N one and two, and it says, okay, the number is two. Uh, and then this guy will say, okay, now I have one, two, three. And the number is uh, because it added this with this and it calculated it divided it by two. So it, it has the kind of the, the average, the final average, right? And then normally nobody learned the, the income or the particular data for each of us, right? Uh, as long as we have this individual protocol here, which kind of um, in some uh, secret way uh, tells a number and then uh, calculates the, the thing, right? So how we do it locally is very similar how we do it across because it's the same problem, right? Um, so how would you do that? Like how would you, like if you want to reveal some number that you don't want others to learn about it, uh, what would you do uh, to, to make it kind of a secure? that uh, we don't announce the number per se, but we kind of uh, learn what the average is, right? So we have some sort of secret number of every one of us, and we want to have kind of a protocol that uh, prevents us learning about what the number is, right? Sorry. So um, this is just uh, an example, and this is just to kind of make you think how you can design this type of protocols uh, and how, what are the, the trade-offs, like in terms of communication costs and so on. You could use something fancy like uh, some homomorphic encryption, right? So what you could do is you could uh, have some sort of a function that you pass the number into, and it gives you kind of a, a number prime, which is encrypted. And then you could calculate the 
uh, the average on on the uh, those encrypted numbers, and then once you have the sum, so if you have the um, if you have the, the the sum of the um, uh, sorry, if you have the sum of the um, partial numbers, then you have the kind of the function which takes the sum and kind of uh, gets the non encrypted version of the number, right? So you produce homomorphic encryption. But there is kind of a simpler way to do that. So what if um, you um, you decided that uh, you're gonna tell a number to the next person, uh, and so so we're doing it like this. I have my number, my secret number n, and I add to it some some form of uh, blinding factor, some delta, right? And then uh, I kind of. Uh, Tell the sum to Ben, uh, and then I and Ben does it the same with you, and you do the same with him, and you do the same with him, and now we kind of doing the sum. So so we summing over the the numbers with the blinding factor. Uh, so we do one pass around. So then he added his number, you added it, and so on, and then you announce the number, right? So we have a number, uh, and then I tell you what my blinding factor was. And you tell him what your blinding factor was, and you tell him, and he tells me. So we go backwards, and now we have the sum of the deltas. So we do this minus the the sum of the deltas, and then we will have the sum, right? And we didn't tell each other what the number is, right? Um, but you can collude, right? You can say, oh Ben, you know, uh, I can tell you what Mario's blinding factor was. And then Ben can work out what my salary was or what my secret number was because he can because I told him the sum, right? So if he knows what my blending factor was and she colluded with him, then it breaks down, right? So there are some properties that we have to think about, like what the nodes are doing and how much we trust the nodes not to be cheating, and what is the risk of her colluding with Ben to learn my secret number, right? Yeah. <laughs> You can, uh, yeah, so that, yeah, that's true. But with anonymization, there is a little bit of a trick that you need to validate that nobody kind of cheated in the system, right? So there are some additional things. So it, it kind of works like this here as well. So what we do is we kind of do this uh, uh, hop by hop, sometimes with some blinding factor. And sometimes what we do is we actually agree that this, this node with this one agree on the same blinding factor, such that this one says minus delta and this one says plus delta, such that it ends up being kind of irrelevant, right? So if they pairwise agree on the blinding factor, uh, and there is another delta prime and minus delta prime, then we give the numbers to the final uh, node, and then it does the sum and an average, and then because the blinding factors cancel each other, then it's fine, but the supervisor will only learn the data with the blinding factors, not what the blinding factors were, right? So it cannot work out what the total sum was. Uh, do you understand this, more or less? So th there is kind of um, a design process of how you do the interactions and what you need to blind along the way and where do you put the trust? Like, who do you trust? We usually don't trust the coordinator because that's the central component that we don't want to learn anything about anybody. And the central controller usually doesn't want that, doesn't want that responsibility that uh, they know something they should not know, right? And then with the nodes, it kind of depends. If you're working in an uh, environment where you don't think nodes will be colluding to screw some other nodes, then you can be doing some trust-based interactions like we did with the blinding factor. Uh, but if you don't trust each other, then you have to go one step further and design the system in a more uh, secure way and more heavy, like uh, with homomorphic encryption or zero knowledge groups, right? All right, so let's have a break. I was talking for um, some time and we have a couple of slides left and then we will do some use case. And the use case is a little bit tricky. So um, Let's have a pause. So we did the easy part. Um, 
there are some challenges, right? So we already talked about it. We already talked about that some nodes may become unavailable, right? So if we're doing this learning with the user keyboards, uh, Google is using an algorithm that your phone is not gonna send anything to Google unless it is plugged into charger, right? So every time your phone is plugged into the charging, you're sharing data with Google, <laughs> most likely. Uh, if you're not plugged, then your phone is not gonna be used. The reason is that it drains some battery because it needs to do some calculations. It needs to calculate those aggregates. So they don't want users to have bad experience. So they only do that when users sleep and have their phone charged, right? Uh, but they may unplug it, right? So the phone says to Google, oh, hey, I'm in the charger. Do you want some data? And the, the Google says, no, not, not yet. <laughs> and, and then the Google says, okay, can you share the model? And then you unplug the phone and then that's it, right? So the phone disappears, right? Yeah? Are you kind of pros or against this kind of data? Um, <laughs> that's a politician answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the more you share with, like the uh, if all the cars in Norway would have brought this number, everything would have been <laughs> But then you have the oh yeah, by the way, these guys are cheap. Or, yeah. Well, so I mean that the, there are uh, uh, like easy answers. Okay, so an easy answer is if you if your data is attached to you, I'm against it, right? So if if you can say that car was speeding, then of course I'm against it, right? But what if you cannot say that car was speeding, but you know, you know, a thousand cars yesterday was speed, were speeding in Norway, right? But you don't know which ones. You, you just know like thousand cars were speeding yesterday in Norway. Then, well, you know. But then we're kind of over to doing this first thing to check like that. Except for asking by the data, but then Facebook tells us about six months so so here here it's kind of like uh you know you can tell here you don't know and here you are kind of sure you cannot tell it's like guaranteed like we're using crypto that prevents some data leaking right so for that one and for that one the answer might be slightly different right um Facebook is definitely here. Right? <laughs> there is no question if they know what is doing, who is doing what. The question is here. Sometimes we are here, but then we discover vulnerability and we kind of here or here, right? Uh, so how how sure you are that you are here that you will never be here or here, right? Um, sometimes it's not that you will be careful with this back on to see. Yeah, exactly. So, but even if you say, okay, we have 100% guarantee, your personal data not going to leak, we have, uh, you know, cryptographic proofs that the data is secure, do you still support that? And I'm not sure, as you said, it kind of depends, like, because we can do something, it doesn't mean we should do that, right? Yeah, I think, yeah, I don't know, sometimes I have a lot of time, but I've been in the politics, that accidentally they shouldn't have shared images, but very sensitive to like, Literally, a lot of news, the one that they have nothing did, no one actually did that. It's just in the voice, and then the only one that's there. Yeah, so shit can happen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. So that's what, I, like, that's what I was saying here that, like, uh, you cannot really have 100% um, um, assurance. And then shit ha happens, and then you kind of hear or hear uh, by accident uh, or by by some uh, oversight. That's why I think that people are going to need to They need to solve it because the fact that they are not secure, they have no one that is able to do it privately, and that's the whole thing. But then you have such a what what I call if I'm on the path of the face camera, I don't. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah it's more like, do you kind of need to, as a user, always be stepping up? Yeah. 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 So, so, yeah, I don't know. Like, it is a tricky question. And it, 
Like for example, with the Gboard case, is it good that Google harvests all the keyboard uh, interactions of users uh, to improve the experience, to make the Gboard keyboard like really good and really predicting the text that you're typing? The, the data is local to your phone, but they share the models with everybody, right? With all the other phones all around the world. Did you want to type in this password? Why is that password in my dictionary? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exa yeah, exactly. So that that's that's it, right? Yeah, so you can then type up your memory and see what you get if you make a password like that. And say that when the browser literally saying you put the password in the screen. Yeah. That's right. Like the existence of that is basically like it's convenient. Yeah, so so for this for this where you can tie a user to the data, I'm against and I, I am against even for people to opt in, right? I think the companies should not do it even if the people want to opt in for that, right? Um, because that leads to a lot of problems. That's right. Sometimes, sometimes it could be there. And some attacks that can connect this unwanted data. That's right. That's right. So it's complicated. <laughs> yeah. So, but I, I have a saying is it is that I really like that it's so much relevant to our life that the most children in society is if you want to have a new life, then it's convenient to like it. Uh, that's my belief. Yeah, Ben. Yeah, um, but in regards to the keyboard, so. There are some data that we give that is not Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so like if you have a keyboard test, yeah. like, yeah, your face is your face. So just with the, uh, the, the point out the stuff, mm -hmm. everything was just random. It didn't matter what that data was, it was back in the data. Yeah. In the that's why it was just a big Yeah, yeah. You can't really define data without looking at it, and if you look at it, it gets a bit complicated. Yeah. I don't think we can avoid this. So data is being shared. Companies are doing this. Uh, with the GDPR, it's a little bit under control, but yeah, but not entirely. And then uh, people are still abusing it, right? Um, so, and also GDPR doesn't apply to uh, anonymized data. So uh, GDPR doesn't apply to what Google is doing with the keyboard because they claim the data is anonymized and doesn't leak back to you, which probably in most cases is true, but it's hard to prove it, right? As I was saying with the password, for example, right? So it, it gets tricky. So, um, so this trustworthiness is a big question. Then you do need to spend a little bit of time designing it and kind of coordinating how the data will flow. And that's what the second part of the lecture is. So we're gonna design it a little bit. Uh, there was a question about uh, data transparency and like the data quality. What if one of the nodes just does nothing? They don't give any data. They just are uh, free riding. Uh, or they even worse, they put some rubbish or some uh, poison the data with some uh, you know adversarial attacks such that they can manipulate the final model somehow, right? Um, you need some form of data governance and some data quality. And then if you pass everything to the central server, the central server can do the iterations, can do the training and evaluation and training evaluation without much of the messaging overheads. But if you're doing this with the 
uh, decentralized model, there is a lot of messaging, right? So the actual workflow is that what you should do is you should have a sample of the data in the central server, do all the model design and model kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, explorations in a central model. And once you're happy with the model uh, design, not with the model itself, because you, you didn't really use the proper data yet, uh, then you're going to use that process to do that training in the decentralized way, but you're not experimenting, you're not modifying the, uh, everything in those kind of big iterations, because that is really costly. All right. Um, so we, um, um, we discussed that, that, that problem. So we were trying to do a sum uh, in a decentralized fashion. Uh, and then we use the masking factor between two random nodes. Uh, and then what are the positive and negative things? Uh, it protects the central coordinator, the server, from learning anything because we use the, the masking factor. But it assumes that uh, you and Ben don't collaborate, right? Uh, if we don't assume that, then it wouldn't work, right? The, our model wouldn't quite work. So, <coughs> okay. So then there is one more problem. So when we have data on, data in those nodes, um, so we have those three nodes, and now we have, as I said, like this node actually doesn't have any data. Okay, this node has ten rows, and this one has ten million rows. Okay. Um, they train the model. We have a model here, model here, and some random model here because that is just guessing what, you know, we didn't have any evidence. Um, so now, you know, we, we calculate these deltas uh, and we exchange the deltas between the, the models to update themselves. And this model gets kind of actually crappier because of the data sets were not balanced, right? So, um, that's the first problem. The second problem is we, we, we start the process and then this node goes offline. It's like cuts off the connectivity. Somebody unplug the, the keyboard, like the phone from charging. So then you only do this, right? It has a huge effect on the outcome. If one of the nodes drops out and that was kind of the one with the most data, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right, and then the final one, IID. What's IID? Actually, I have a question about that. Yeah, what is IID? And why non-IID data is a problem? You can Google. Did you give us homework for this? I didn't give you homework, yeah. I missed it. I should have. All right, so what does it sound? Uh, what does it mean? What does it mean independent? It means this and then that. So if I... Independent and independent. Yeah. So, so how, how do you understand this? So let's say you have... Um, Let's say we back to your problem with the, with the board with two sets of icons uh, and you have two, let, let's say you have three data sources. And in this one, you have the boards, uh, boards which have both or uh, one of the sets of icons. Uh, here you only have one and here you only have both, right? then the model, models will be kind of biased. They will be completely different for this, for this training set, for this training set, and for this training set, right? The models will not share the common patterns, right? They will be kind of uh, really different because here I only, always have only one set of items. I, I am missing the second one. Here I always have two, and here I sometimes have one and, and, and both, right? So, <clears throat> From the model perspective, when the training is happening, this training set and this uh, 
never saw a case with one I, I concept, right? It's like completely different problem. Uh, so here is the, there is no answers. So here is kind of an example again from, uh, I, I found it in Google, um, which demonstrates uh, what are the data sets which are IID, right? So I can use this to train the model or I can use this to train the model and both models will be kind of about the same problem, right? Recognizing digits, right? But if I train this model, it will really learn only the recognizing zeros and fours. It will not train about recognizing digits. It's a different problem to this. And so, so that for that model, and that model will only learn about recognizing fives and sevens, right? And uh, if we say, okay, now merge it, what's common between those two models? There is nothing common. <laughs> so, so the merging is like zero. Like it will just say, okay, uh, we need to clear the whole thing. Like uh, there is nothing in common. Nothing gets kind of uh, magnified nothing kind of gets reinforced right you just learn some random shit and you learn something and then the common part is like zero right whereas here you learn something and you learn something and the common part is actually the part about recognizing different digits right because they learn about recognizing three and recognizing zero and so on right so uh, the non-iid problem is in machine in federated machine learning that when you have this distributed data sets, you want them to be as IID as possible, right? You want them to be as, as this as possible, but will that happen? Maybe, maybe not, right? In the case of the keyboard, uh, we've already discussed like uh, based on my profile, I'm, I'm putting in uh, Polish words sometimes and you're putting your own language words, right? Google needs to clean that up. We kind of, uh, dragging the model away from the common English centric uh, way, right? Uh, so they need to do more data processing to isolate and to uh, pro um, pre-process the data in such a way that it kind of aligns with this IID requirement. Make sense? <clears throat> All right, so um, the biggest uh, federated learning framework is uh, TensorFlow. Uh, and TensorFlow has a federated module, which allows you to do TensorFlow feder federated. Um, and it allows you to kind of compose those type of uh, computations. Um, and it is divided into two parts, which is the federated learning API, which allows you to design your algorithm in, in a higher level of abstraction such that you can split your data and kind of are distributed across the workers and then uh, delegate the learning to those workers and then do the aggregation operations to combine the results, right? And they have some predefined operations here that you can already use. For everything else, what is not predefined here, you have to code it yourself, right? So you have to basically design uh, your flow of data and what the workers are doing and how the computations happen, you need to kind of orchestrate it. Um, and then they have kind of a local runtime such that you can test your design workflow like locally before you actually deploy it for the, for the system to, to work, right? That's pretty straightforward. All right, so um, I have to sit down. <laughs> And I linked um, some of the. Do you have any questions about this so far? Yeah. 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 So it yeah it, it boils down to your metrics like how you calculate the final sort of score and how you compare it right. Usually it is some sort of vector. 
and then you have certain weights of what you pay attention to. So time, like how long something was, gives you uh, a more guarantee that it's not gonna swing much in either direction. It gives you more stability. So they may rank that higher yeah. than the current hot. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Yeah, there is a comment from Besnik because he's digging into federated learning and he's, his comment is uh, spot on. It says, TFF is quite limited in terms of real world use as far as we have seen. Uh, in simulation cases scenario, there are some limitations. Yes, there are. Uh, and that's a, a, it is a valid comment. Um, there is quite hype about it in the medical domain for the hospitals to share data for uh, building better models about some rare diseases because each hospital only have small number of samples, but in combination, all hospitals have enough to train a model about detecting something. So there is kind of a hype of uh, how to do that with the hospital data. And most hospital data and most patients data can be sort of aggregated into models that don't leak personal data, right? Uh, sometimes it cannot, like for example, anything to do with uh, genetics, of course, leaks your genetics, and that is, you know, very personal. Uh, but in general, uh, it, it kind of works quite well. So there is there is that. Uh, there is some federated learning, for example, for detecting the passwords which are uh, which have leaked or which have been um, compromised, right? I'm sure you've got some emails from Google telling you to change some of your service passwords because they know it's the same as somebody else's leaked password, even though they don't know what uh, the actual password, yeah, no, they know, but that is kind of local to your storage. It wasn't shared, right? So your passwords were not shared outside of your computer, but based on kind of a hashing and some uh, uh, techniques for sharing some of the models, they can tell if that password is was compromised or not, right? Okay, so I have this uh, Gboard use case, so I encourage you to watch that video. It's uh, 40 minutes and it's kind of interesting. Um, so it, it goes over some of the things that we went over. Uh, and then I have two collapse um, sheets, yeah? Yeah, Collab is good. I like Collab too. Uh, but instead of going into some actual machine learning exercise, which you went through last semester, I thought I will kind of show you what is um, what is involved in setting up kind of your own federated learning um, workflow. And the plan was good, but I spent like, you know, three hours yesterday doing it and then i said ah oh, shit you know it's kind of hard <laughs> to tell you all about it but what you can do is it's kind of a self-learning uh, module so if you open it open the the first one and the second one uh you can copy it to your own collab workspace and you can kind of uh, because it is a tutorial so you will kind of learn uh how how it works there are some small quirks so collab is kind of like a jupyter notebooks uh you can execute python code and you can install Python, but it all runs on the Google infrastructure. So you don't need to locally install anything on your computer. It's all done in the cloud. And then you can share the model and you can share what you want in Google Drive, or you can even source data from uh, uh, Google Drive or from your, you can drop some files into it and, and so on. So it's, it's kind of allows you a, a bit of flexibility. And also it's very easy for sharing, uh, for sharing the, um, the sheets and as well as the, um yeah that's right so it, it is kind of the same as with the jupyter notebooks you kind of say what you want to import and then if there there are sometimes some uh, required installs 
So you may need to install certain dependencies because before you can uh, import them. Um, I've noticed that the first one um, sometimes complains and you need to run it twice. Um, and then um, I commented out those pip installs because if you do it once, it kind of doesn't work when you try to work, like install it again. So you need to install it once and then call it twice with the second time th those lines commented, right? It's a, a bit of a workaround. So as you see, it kind of worked. And then I can import all those uh, necessary uh, dependencies or not. <laughs> so here I didn't run it twice. So maybe that's the problem. Um, no, that's a different problem. Uh, so it kind of complains about the TensorFlow Federated. So I, as I said, you probably want to install it, uh, run it again. Uh, after it installs, comment it out, run it again, and then do the second part, right? Um, so once you have all the dependencies in, you have um, this annotation. So there is, um, Conceptually, uh, it, it is very interesting because if you think about it, you have to design the computations that will happen on the, uh, on the edge nodes, but the edge nodes are ne not necessarily running Python, right? You are kind of designing the local computation to be expressed in Python, but when you deploying it for the final edge nodes, it has to somehow magically happen that they run the logic that you want, and that is not actually Python. Uh, it is some sort of uh, platform independent, like a representation of the computation, right? So there is a little bit of overheads. Um, it's still doing the installation. <coughs> so there is a little bit of overheads because you have to annotate some of your computations with this, uh, with this federated computation or uh, other annotations about the types. So you do need to declare your functions and you need to say um, what the parameters of your functions will be in a declarative way, such that the underlying machinery can generate the actual logic to run on the nodes. So from that point of view, it is kind of interesting. Like uh, if you're into designing architectures and kind of a federated systems or decentralized systems, like learning how Google is doing it with the um, TensorFlow federated, it is kind of interesting to see how things work and how things are annotated and how they kind of declare uh, various things because we want to make the computation kind of easy such that you compose it in a way of uh, composing some small building blocks. But at the same time, you want also to have kind of a concise syntax of declaring what is happening, right? So for example, here we have a number which is uh, a float 32. And on each client, each client will have one float, right? But here we have a type which says it's a collection of floats on all the clients, right? It's not a single value, it's like it's a collection. And then you can, for example, calculate average of that of that collection. Uh, so it's kind of a they call it multi-set. And then um, if you uh, have, for example, that all the numbers of on all the clients is the same then you don't use the curly brackets. You basically have it's just one number, right? It's not a collection anymore. It's not a multiset. It's just one number. And then for the processing, you're kind of doing it with structs and with some other uh, data structures and, and things like that. So um, I can, <coughs> sorry, I cannot go over the whole thing with you, but it is um, something you can kind of read and try to understand not in details of how exactly it works, but what are the design principles and what you have to do extra into composing your co computations in contrast to just doing it uh, in, a, in a greedy mode. So they have a mode which they call uh, like, a, well, let me see. Yeah, so executing, yeah, so for example, here, we are running the computation in a simulation mode, uh, and we don't pass the numbers from the end nodes. We just pass it as an array, like directly into our function, right? So we kind of using that function, which was de declared up, up there as a decentralized computation, 
but we using it as if it was a normal Python function, and it is. So here it is a normal Python function, and I can pass it that array of uh, numbers, and it will calculate the average. But it the logic and the declaration. So it's called get average temperature. So if I go get average temperature, you see we basically get all the sensors readings. So sensor reading is the parameter passed to the function, uh, which will be the multi set, the, the list of the of the uh, float thirty twos. And then we're running like a federated mean on that, right? Uh, why are we not running a normal mean? Because the data is all over the place. Like it, the data is not local. So we need to calculate this kind of a federated mean. Uh, but when we're running it in the kind of a simulation mode, we pretend that it just happens behind the scene. Do you, do you get it? Um, so you can mix this sort of a debugging and simulation mode. Uh, with the federated mode and test some things locally, and then actually use the same implementation for the uh, decentralized case, right? Uh, you don't have two implementations, you just have one, but the remote one is kind of done for you uh, automatically. And they call it, um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they demonstrate that it actually doesn't execute locally. Um, yeah, so you see here the operator TFF federated mean cannot be easily modeled as an ordinary operator in Python because the data is like remote. Um, but we can kind of uh, pre pretend that it does and it kind of works as a federated operator. Um, so you can compose the federated computations uh, and okay let me scroll a little bit down there was a, an example of um, yeah so here we have a constant which is a tens normal tensor flow constant and then if you try to do this uh, computation it will complain that this is outside of this context right uh, so if you change it in such a way that uh, you just have a function and then you have kind of you are calling a function within that context then python engine will be able to kind of generate the code for this because it can work with functions uh, but not with the with the constants like this way and then you kind of uh, executing um, uh, They call it eager or no. So, um they use a kind of a very simple example of uh, temperature sensors and calculating a mean. So the actual exercise is like really trivial, but you will sort of understand that there is quite a lot of machinery that is kind of required to orchestrate the process, right? And you need to play with this kind of a federated operators uh, of what is done uh, in a kind of a decentralized way and what how it would be if it, if it was implemented kind of just as a normal uh, TensorFlow or uh, kind of worksheet, right? So the bottom line is you need to use those kind of uh, decorators. You need to declare the types and then you kind of doing some normal implementation, sometimes using some uh, federated operators or aggregators like this federated mean. It's called like a federated aggregator. And you have kind of a plethora of them to compose what you want to achieve. And then it will kind of magically happen, right? Uh, they magically distribute it across all the, all the nodes. Um, so yeah, you can kind of uh, play with this. Let me try if the, if the system works with the algorithm I told you to, yeah. So then you have an error, then you comment it out. Then you run it again, it will work. And then you run this one and 
it doesn't work. Okay, so I will try to kind of uh, see uh, how you can. Uh, I got it working last night, uh, and then I could test all the other ones. But you don't really need to run it. You just need to sort of understand the the logic, and then if you really need to use a federated um, machine learning, then you will have your own, right? Uh, and then it's it's better to be debugging and kind of fixing your own uh, sheet instead of this demo sheet. All right, so any questions? There are two. Uh, so this one kind of goes over the basic, um, the basic machinery of how to uh, organize it. And then the second one actually use, uses the building blocks to do this uh, mean calculation for the, for the temperature, right? So this one is like an application on top of that. It's, it's shorter and it kind of uh, it already uses what you have defined here, right? So the second one is a little bit easier to follow. In fact, I was kind of thinking yesterday that you could start with this one and uh, only do this one if you're really interested to see how it works behind the scenes. Uh, but this understanding of Python non Python, it's kind of good to know because you would think, why do they do this gymnastics with you know with the types? If uh, I could just have it like I do with uh, you know pandas or keras, right? Uh, just just do Python stuff. Uh, the problem is, you know, as I say. On the edge nodes, not everything is Python, right? Okay, so <coughs> that's that's it for today. Um, I am not sure if any of you is doing any machine learning uh, projects or if having kind of an extra machine learning topic or exercise would be good. So, what do you think? Yeah. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Yeah. So how about the other, other ones? I think the projects are kind of selected already and you know what you're doing and then machine learning is only relevant for uh, Besnik and um, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's the one. Uh, you can do some clustering, yeah. So, um, but do you think we should dedicate like a practical session for everybody doing something or is it only kind of a per project? I, I thought third project is better. Yeah. So let's do that. So I will talk with Abile and I will check with him what we do on Thursday. And then from next week onwards, I think we will actually start doing some uh, some lectures, right? Uh, so I will let you know, I, I will have to talk with him today and then we'll let tho those people know who may need to, to prepare something for next Monday. Um, I am not sure if, that will be next Monday or the Monday in two weeks time. Might be the Monday in two weeks time. I will check uh, with Abile. All right, so uh, thank you for uh, participating and we'll see you maybe on Thursday or maybe on Monday. <laughs>